Alrighty, guys, so I have run a pirate-themed one-shot, and I'm going to talk about it for a bit. And this time I'm going to break the video into three parts. So part one is going to be my revisited thoughts on the previous session, the previous one-shot, the Wild West game. Then part two is going to be my sort of meta-psychoanalysis thought process running through this game this pirate one shot and then part three is going to be like a literal recap the content of the session of this pirate one shot so regarding the last session i definitely overreacted a bit and i think the main thing that i think i might have done wrong when expressing my thoughts about it was probably my severe misalignment of expectations. I had very low expectations for the first session with lots of new players that I kind of thought was almost bound to fall apart to some degree. And then I had very high expectations for the second session, especially after how well the first one went, or at least how well I perceived it as having gone after having low expectations of it. But that second time I figured, oh, well, you know, we just played a super mega banger to end all bangers. Like this next session with the fully group kitted out with experienced players, this is going to be the best thing that has ever been played in the history of ever. I see now that those expectations were honestly, if anything, probably switched around and backwards in that the first group, I don't think I gave a proper appreciation of the nervous excitement and novelty and all the great things that come with playing with new players in D&D. And then with the second session, I don't think I necessarily accounted for the fact that this was like session one of 40 for people for these players and that there wasn't necessarily anywhere close to that pressure to perform well as i thought there kind of was for everyone in that first session and i don't think i gave the proper value and appreciation that came from the intuition that everyone had going into that second session which i do ultimately think brought its own unique kind of uh joy and entertainment out of that session also i certainly when it comes to these videos have a habit or a tendency to get caught up on the pessimistic side of the sessions i kind of take a utilitarian practical approach and by that i mean i very much so focus on the problems and how we can go about solving them which on the one hand i think can be useful i think again i undervalued the benefit of the positive side and showing the appreciation that i have for the good things in these sessions so i know i made a non-zero amount of my friends a non-zero amount of upset with that last video which justifiably so i think if someone has said those same things about me that i would also be upset uh and although i don't disagree with my sentiment that i expressed i certainly regret how i actually went about the execution of expressing those ideas i certainly think i could have been a little softer with my uh ideas and opinions there i have in some way experienced a a uh, true fall from grace on the same tier as Bill Cosby, I think is fair to say. I went from having 10 players for that last session 
down to three players for this session. So in an attempt to try to curry some favor with my friends, I am just going to spend the next couple of minutes just gassing each of you guys up. And it is possible that this is going to come across as sarcastic or facetious. Uh, but the last arc of my life, you know, the whole ultra liberal CEO grind set is over. We are in the maximum positivity all the time now arc of my life. So I I just hope that you believe me when I say that everything I'm going to express is a true, genuine, and sincere thought from moi. So, number one, Luke, I award you the highest award that I can, and that is a great appreciation for your ability to care about other people. I certainly appreciate the amount of time you take towards other people's feelings. I appreciate that you take the time after the sessions and after the game, or not after the, well, after the videos to reach out to me and actually express your side of the thoughts that you had and to uh, be willing to, you know, dialogue and converse and engage with me. I certainly do greatly appreciate that. And it genuinely, like that alone, makes my whole experience trying to share my hobby with you guys and has made it feel that it's been worth it. Uh, to Gabe, I appreciate that you show interest in the game itself from both a mechanical system side and to take the time to actually want to learn about the lore of this world that my brother and I have put so much time into writing and the fact that you are willing to show that by trying to incorporate these ideas and such into both your suggestions mid-game after the game and also incorporating them into the character that you make itself that that certainly is appreciated uh julian i am naming you the callback master i sometimes feel like you are the one player not purely driven by id when we are in a session and that you actually take the time to reference things that had occurred in previous sessions and in even previously in this same session i i think you do a great deal of work towards moving the sessions and making them feel like cohesive narrative holes. And to Joey, you are a true martyr. Uh, the fact that you Uber to the city back and forth every single session, that I understand is uh, not convenient. And that, that sacrifice both from an annoyance side and from a cost side is not lost on me. And the fact that you are willing to do that to come to our games, uh, that does mean a lot to me. Vince, you know, well, on the one hand, I think you, know, you are close to coming to Luke's crown, to his throne, when it comes to being number one post-session, post-video reacher outer. So... Luke, you might have to step up your game there. But, <laughs> Vince, I do sometimes get the sense that we might be the only people that are on the same wavelength when it comes to how exciting this game should be. I think you have a very intuitive sense of pacing that I, I think obviously not everyone has. And so for that, I, I appreciate you. And Hunter, 
Thank you for actually taking up the DM mantle. I can say that I don't think I've ever experienced you ever doing anything at my table that I could have ever considered like annoying or disrespectful or anything. You know, I, I know it takes a lot of courage and a lot of bravery to be a DM. Uh, you know, we share an unbreakable link of camaraderie. We are the only ones that have been through that crucible of war that is running a campaign. And for that, I thank you for your service as being a dungeon master. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to my friends, I, I do, I genuinely love and appreciate when you guys, when, when, when you leave comments and when I read them, it does brighten my cold, dead, shriveled heart. And, you know, there's, there's at, at least a moment where I, I even have to fight back a tear to some of the kind things that you guys say about the, the sessions and the videos. So, truly, thank you for being a friend. I also forgot to mention in my last video what was going to be the default ending of the Wild West session video. I just, not that I necessarily thought that this was going to be what occurred, but just my sort of working assumption just so that I had an ending in mind to kind of steer things towards just in case nothing else really seemed to catch on as where the session was gonna go uh, which was effectively the Aladdin ending where Wild Will Warlock would effectively have become Jafar and wished to become king of all genies and then like a player would grab the iron flask and then uh i command them with the whole i've got a flask and i want you in it to 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 suck wild will back into that and then it was sort of and there not that we ended up using that or even if that 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 wasn't even close to coming up in either session but i i just wanted to mention that that was my draft one ending Okay, okay, okay. Now, you know, this would not be a proper Manling Joe recap video if I didn't cry and complain about at least one thing. So we're going to do some crying, and we're going to do some complaining, but this time, not targeted to any person or players or anything. This is a complaint about the greatest big bad evil guy in Dungeons and Dragons history the truly horrific and evil beast that is scheduling oh god i hate scheduling all right let me do a little bit of prefacing first a little okay so i i hate this thing in the D, D subreddit that shows up constantly where people care so much about how players appreciate the content of the session and I, when when it, like these posts show up daily where someone's like I, I i worked his backstory and his magic item into a character arc into the session and like he didn't even uh, show up and it's like I did all this work for you, dude. How could you possibly do this? I, you think I wanted to write this? You think I wanted to write it? This is terrible. I like your backstory is awful. It's fan fiction garbage. But I put up with it anyway, just to satisfy you and to get your adulation. Which I just I hate that mindset so much that it appears constantly. Like, you know, if you don't like writing the arcs and if you don't like writing the sessions, if, if what you care about is the appreciation and adulation of your players, simple. Cut out the middleman. Work an extra eight hours a week 
and then just give all your players, just Venmo them $25, and then you don't have to write anymore, and it will be guaranteed that they'll appreciate you uh, at, at least $25 worth more than they did before. Um, which, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm being salty. I'm projecting. I very much so fell into this trap and very much so was of this school of thought for at least some part of my DMing career. And I am embarrassed that I had at some point subscribed to that. But I've since learned how to stop worrying and just enjoy writing adventures and just writing sessions and content that will never see the light of day. But just because I thought it was good, fun practice to see how ideal of a session or an adventure I can write in a vacuum and I really at least like to imagine that at this point appreciation from players for my content is really not what I'm looking for at this point and at this point I just enjoy DMing enough that that's really all I need to get out of this whole transaction. But when it comes to scheduling, uh, if like if you're gonna appreciate anything, that 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 is the thing that I actually find to be work and like find to be annoying and be a thing that I would otherwise not go out of my way to do but do so because it is a necessity. And like, at this point, you know, I've been working as a receptionist for a minute, so I now understand the fundamentals that go into having a proper schedule and the bare level of commitment that you need from people to expect them to show up. So some things I've learned is and another thing that I, again i feel like i see this in the D D subreddit constantly is send a group chat and then expect that to be enough for a scheduled session to be occurred which most definitely is not the case if you want to ensure that like a session is actually going to happen at a given time and place and day and whatever you need to send each individual person a message to confirm that's what's going to happen. And again, that physical act, I don't mind typing however many messages and then sending that to however many people. I hate this whole psychology game behind it, though. That I just absolutely hate, because I very much so like trying to label myself and have this identity as a laid-back, epicurean, carefree anarchist, and the complete opposite has to be the case in order for D, D to be played i need to now project this persona of myself as a commitment obsessed clingy kind of person that i absolutely want to be the last thing that people associate with me when they think about me I hate that this bounce of thoughts of obsession with commitment is, or this persona I'm imparting as being this obs like a commitment obsessed person is this struggle is going on in my mind the entire time that I have to like wait for responses and even it's just got to be a thing that i have to think about to some degree 
until we're actually there at the table and everyone has arrived and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Oh, God, I just hate it. Uh, when it comes to the other aspects and, like, responsibilities of, like, hosting, that I really don't mind as much. Uh, because, for one... Well, I guess I, I'm mainly I think that it sort of just cancels out with other people having to find transportation. So I'm, I'm ultimately willing to call that a wash. Yeah, I, I hate all those that amount of time that I am like before the session is played and I'm still mid scheduling mode. And I have to be worried about this whole dance of boundaries that's going on and whether or not I am overstepping them and like asking too much of people and trying to make this be a thing that happens more frequently than people realistically actually want out of it. Or sometimes I'll get myself in the other mindset and think to myself, like, Joe, you need to be the one setting boundaries and you need to be the one demanding other people are putting in equal amounts of effort into scheduling events and stuff like that. And I I just, I hate all the thought that has to, like, go into it and the energy that gets expended in just this this dance of scheduling. I just despise it. Which again, on the other hand, I think this is the number one enemy of literally every single D&D group that has ever occurred since the beginning of history. So I I I genu I think this is just one you have to you have to power through. I don't think there's a fix to this. This is just, this is me just venting. Yeah, two quick little clarifications, though. I do not blame anyone for being avoidant when it comes to wanting to make a commitment. That is extraordinarily understandable, and I am the exact same way. And number two, I do ultimately think DMing. I just, I find it fun enough that I am willing to go through this dance every time just to be able to do it. Okay, part two, my overview, grand thoughts of the session. Overall, I think it was amazing. I am, uh, the players actually did an excellent, excellent job. I could not have asked for more. They were all very high energy and they were into their characters the whole time. Uh, they, everyone did two thumbs up. Great job. I... Starting off, I loved how the character creation process worked out. Instead of like writing everyone's characters beforehand and then giving it to them, this time I printed out a whole bunch of slips of paper. Each had either a class, a race, a personality, a history, or a flaw, each of which provided some special ability and some stats or penalties. And then I gave them to my players one by one and then allowed for a trade period each time I handed out one of these slips so everyone had a reason to share with each other what their guys were and then what they could do uh, everyone had the option to kind of customize their guys to make them closer to what they wanted and also everyone like read their abilities one by one so everyone was pretty like intimately familiar with how each of these various aspects affected their characters, and then with how they mechanically functioned. Uh, so overall, I absolutely loved how the character creation worked. And in addition to that, rule two of improv, if X is true, then Y must have been true. Everyone did an amazing job with taking these five random character traits and then weaving them together to make fully fleshed out characters that make sense. Uh, for example, Luke, he was both the ship's chef and he was an a he failed out of wizard school was his history. 
Uh, so he had a fun little bit about how he used to try to make alchemical potions and brews and then would accidentally make just delicious tasting soups and broths. Uh, there, there, there was a lot of fun little uh, bits like that, which was great. I will say, name-wise, I was slightly worried we were going to end up with three Flambopulous Dinkelbergs or something, but uh, I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised people came off with proper, fitting, good pirate names. I, I, I am proud of you guys. You, you're, you're learning. You, you guys are moving in the direction of good, uh, creative ability so keep it up okay so one thing that i think i want to try doing differently next time i think next time i try running DD, i really want to try to enforce an intermission i think i'm gonna do like a halfway through the session 20 minute break mostly for myself as a dm i think okay uh, okay, talking about the session again and how it went. Act one, I think, was great. Very tense, very fun. Act two, also great. Very tense. No one knew what was going to happen. The players didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen. And then act three, things got sloppy. Things got rushed. I knew how it was going to end is really the problem. I knew they were going to succeed in the end and then just did everything to tie up loose ends as quickly as possible and then made sure that they got to the ending and it was that that was eh. but the first two acts were amazing i think if i have a break built in though this will help me greatly because now i can take into consideration as to what has occurred in act 1 what is occurring in act 2 and what is likely to make the most sense as a finale for act three rather than just having to try to make something up as we get there so the break mostly would be for me as a dm just to be able to plan something cool for the last hour or of how however long of the game i could also it's it's an excuse for people to refresh their beverages, go to the bathroom, do whatever they need to do, take care of. Which, honestly, stuff like that uh, doesn't really bother me as a DM if people need to do that mid-session. I, I find my friends are pretty good at being able to find slow points where they can like take those breaks as needed uh, without it coming across as disruptive. And if anything, uh, there, there were a couple of times where... Uh, there, there was going to be an interruption, or and by that I just mean like people were going to get off topic, and then they caught themselves, were able to police themselves, and then say, "Oh, this will wait until the end of the session," which that 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 made me feel happy. I'm I'm glad that you guys did that. Uh, but again, if we did the twenty minute break, that could be an opportunity for people to break out into those conversations without having to worry about. Uh, messing up anything now okay but here's here's the risk here's the risk is that at the midpoint of act two i think people are at their highest level of energy they are at their like peak momentum so i think trying to call for a break there is really risky because i think you might lose that momentum and then not be able to get it back i think on the other side though by the time that three hour mark rolls around, that is when people's batteries are draining. And I find there's a pretty hard fall off there. And that pretty consistently, there is not going to be momentum and energy there anyway. So I think I'm willing to try risking the break in the hopes that people will be able to come back to the last like hour or two of the session with renewed spirits i think to add to this though something that i absolutely want to do for the next session as well is find a hard cutoff time for people because we started at 8 p.m and then at this point it was already 11 p.m and we were 
just starting Act 3. So the only thing I was worrying about was making sure that I could tie up every single loose end and actually get this to a conclusive, satisfying ending as soon as I humanly could. So I didn't really have anything bad happen. I just had everyone succeed at everything. Didn't call for any roles because I didn't want to risk there being failures and then this potentially dragging on for any longer. I do think, though, in the future, Act 3, that's when I absolutely need to ratchet up the stakes. Um, again, I, I, I need to know how much time I have beforehand so that I can ideally get us to this point with at least like an hour left. I think, if anything, again, something I am bad at as a DM uh, that I've just struggled with for a long time and continue to is my ability to punish and or straight up kill players. I think Act 3, that is the perfect time to start killing players, especially because you, it's, it's pretty much a guaranteed players are going to succeed in the end. Like, we've all watched stories and we know how incredibly unsatisfying they are when the players fail at the end. But if I start killing players, then in future one-shots, the question is not going to remain of, are we going to win in the end? Because obviously, yes, you are. But the question becomes, who is actually going to make it out alive? And then that will actually make Act 3 extremely tense. Especially because it'll be a proper rising escalation of stakes of, of, over the course of the session. Uh, so I, it's just, it's such an obvious answer, but something I failed to apply. But I definitely think that I'm going to do that next time. Especially because once you're at the end of the session, it doesn't really matter if people die or not, because at this point there's no rest of the session to play in anyway. In general, though, when it comes to this whole experiment of one-shots, I'm tired, boss. I don't know how much I'm I am close I'm I think I was already like burnt out by the last one and already burnt out for this one too. I'm still gonna try to eke out one last more one though, where I place the absolute greatest of emphasis on ensuring that I have a solid act three with all my plans and ideas of things that I think can Make sure that a good Act 3 happens. In addition, I'm still going to continue my crusade. I'm going to try my absolute hardest to convince some of my friends to actually give their hand at running a one-shot as well. And one of the reasons why I liked running one-shot specifically so much is, again, oh, how much I'm not fond of scheduling. And if I can just do one shots instead, then it's always just, it's just a single like localized amount of scheduling that I have to do. Just a single week's worth of scheduling that you have to do. But like in general, ooh, the amount of weight from having to prepare a full one shot, it, it has been bearing kind of heavy on me uh so i think what i'm going to try moving forward is i think i'm going to try moving to three shots and having like a uh you know three session long adventures which on the one hand i think that'll be a lot less upfront preparation that i'll have to do because we could just instead of having to like come up with ideas and stuff for brand new characters every single session we we can just do the same one characters for three sessions worth of length and it can just be like one same setting that i can stretch out into three sessions so it'll greatly reduce the load that i have to uh worth of preparation that i have to put into each individual session the problem though now you have to schedule three weeks worth of sessions if you have to do a three shot and then that amount of commitment is compounding and that you are now like scheduling like three weeks ahead and it, it is like an exponential amount of 
foresight that you now have to ask from people. Now, another fun little uniquity of this session was this was my first time ever trying to run D&D under the effects of psilocybin, which is, well, for one, it was a pretty small dose in the grand scheme of things. But it was certainly an interesting experience. Uh, something that I had have actually considered in the past before, but I'd always decided against it because I, I felt like this is an activity that requires too much focus, and this is the kind of chemical that makes your mind wander and will make it relatively impossible to maintain the amount of focus that something like running D&D requires. But... There was actually a strange, comforting, synergistic quality to running D&D with this because since it actually like required such like an intense amount of focus, it felt like I didn't even have the option to potentially let my mind wander. I do think there's like an inherent nervousness that comes with taking it at all every time you take it which i do think adds an element of excitement to the you know the level of energy in general uh, i certainly think it contributed to the goofy and sloppy factor of the session for sure but i think it uh, won in the equation and the fact that i think it added to buy-in which I think is possibly like the most valued aspect that like a DM is looking for when it comes to D and D. Um, I don't necessarily want to say that I think it added to verisimilitudinitis, but I do think it contributed to a connection to characters and feeling like you care more about the stakes. There was like a single moment where I felt like, oh my god, this is too much. I'm gonna have to like pull the ripcord and like just bail out of this. Uh, fortunately, I just like powered through and that was just, it was just a one time blip and then didn't occur again for the rest of the session. So I am glad that I powered through that. Ultimately, Looking back, though, I think I mostly feel kind of indifferent to the effects of it that it added as a component to DMing. I think I might be willing to experiment with it in the future, but probably only under the stipulation of if everyone there was doing it but i do think it's got like a value like i do think it's worth trying to experiment again because i i think it does increase your sort of natural ability as an empath as in whatever innate ability humans have to pick up on and experience the vibes of whoever is around them I yeah I th I think it makes you very hypersensitive to that. You know, if everyone around you is mad, you will also get mad. If everyone around you is very sad, you will also get very sad, which I think has a very helpful potential when it comes to this sort of collaborative improv storytelling game where I think it would be very handy to have this tool that allows everyone to be on the same page emotionally. Uh, but if anything, I think it's kind of solidified my stance that I can't really be comfortable around uh, sober people while under the influence. This session has also pretty strongly solidified my stance on the fact that the amount of time writing and preparing a session has a very low correlation to how much fun and how enjoyable that session ends up being uh because this one i pretty much just typed into chat gbt I, I write me a pirate session and then i just 
ran that, which chat GPT. I know this thing. It's going to ruin education. It's going to ruin politics, the political sphere. It's going to ruin the Internet. It's going to ruin the world, not in a cool Skynet way, but just in a very sad drudgery of slop kind of way. But oh my god, if this thing is not just insanely good at what it does. Like, I I know the internet does nothing but dunk on it and saying it's bad at everything, but whew, it actually it's pretty cool. Like, yeah, give it a fair shot, is all I'm gonna say. Okay, but I, I do think I'm coming back to my stance that the amount of time you put into writing the session matters a lot less than using the correct formula. If you have the right template to use to structure your one shot, that's going to be the most important thing. Overall, I think I'm going to give one last proper one shot a try. Hyper focus on getting the perfect ending. And then I hope to make a video about what I think will be the maximally useful one shot formula so that to, to maximize that proportion of as little effort you can put into a one shot while gaining the most amount of enjoyable experience from it. Okay, part three. We are now on to the session itself, the recap and its contents. So we're going to start with the big old list of slips that I had made with races and their abilities. Humans, you get to reroll stuff. Dwarf, you get to not be pushed around. I figured this might come up if you're on the pirate boat and you don't want to get like knocked around by waves or something. Elf, you get to see magic stuff. And halfling, you never get frightened, which now realizing completely forgot about this. I wanted it to come up though later with the undead pirates. Okay, now for the rolls. The chef, he can make a big feast that heals everyone. No one actually ended up taking like any damage, so that never ended up being needed. The captain can inspire people. The chaplain is uh, basically his channel divinity, the war path thing, or they can use it to turn undead. And Powder Monkey can just, I think it's like adamantine weapons or something that just insta-crit objects, something like that. And then the Chirurgeon gets to amputate someone Okay, for the histories, the backgrounds for the characters, we've got Officer, makes you good at dueling, the Sailor, uh-oh, I'm now realizing I forgot to put an ability for Sailor. Good thing no one ended up going with that, well, no one drew it anyway, so didn't end up mattering. Monkey King, you get a golden banana, which lets you summon an army of monkeys. This is probably my favorite one. Unfortunately, the monkey army did not get up, end up getting used. Stowaway, you're 14 years old, and you hid there, and you're really good at hiding. Arcane Initiate, you get to cast a spell. And the personalities, family man, family woman. You've got the indomitable will to love. You can just save someone from dying. Married to the sea, you got a little glass bottle that you can drink, and then you're immune to water stuff. Superstitious, you get to re-roll some stuff. Nautical Scholar. You're just really good at knowing stuff. And then Reckless Abandon. I guess I probably should have renamed this to better fit with the theme. Um, but you're the Daredevil. You just get bonuses. As, as everyone, by the Daredevil, I mean a Daredevil. You get bonuses whenever you try stuff that's really risky. Okay, Flaws, Peg Leg, and Hook Hand. Classic pirate stuff. Fire Bug. This is one of my favorite Warhammer madnesses that you can get. Uh, unfortunately, this one didn't end up coming up. Crippling guilt. Uh, th this one we it was almost uh, almost something that occurred. Didn't end up happening though. One eyed we had didn't really end up coming up. And sirens lament. You are cursed and can die. This one I honestly I was not sure if it would be fun or unfun. No one ended up going with it. Like I guess probably for the best. God forbid it end up did end up being unfun. Well, I also just think it would have been very, very memorable and funny if someone just died of a heart attack. Okay, so for our characters that we had, we had Harriet de Barbara, elf, captain, pirate, 
They were also the Monkey King, Nautical Scholar, Peg Leg. We had Blastin' Bobby, Halfling, Powder Monkey, Stowaway, uh, Firebug. And we had Billy Blades, Dwarf Chef, that uh, had the Arcane Initiate and was one-eyed. Uh, also, the Mary to the Sea. So, uh, great names all around. It's the beginning of the session. We find them on the Plundering Pup. A uh, good old classic pirate ship. They First thing that happens is they see a rival ship. They see a merchant ship that they are both flying the same colors of. And the merchant ship lowers down someone. They come over to try to ask you for help because they are low on rations or whatever you call it, provisions. And then, so I planned on having like a quick little nautical battle here. But at this very first point, as they attempted to send some semaphore signals, uh, the very first roll of the session the captain rolled a natural one. I had decided to interpret this as my inciting incident occurring early. Originally what was going to happen is there was going to be a nautical battle. They were going to fly, not fly, uh, like jump over on the ropes, do a whole pirate thing, kill them all, intimidate them all, do whatever they needed to do, then take the treasure, which is going to be spices and herbs and dyes and all that good stuff. And then upon getting all this booty, and possibly even taking the second ship, the first mate, William Wid Warlock, was going to attempt a mutiny. Now, the point here, I wasn't really sure what to do with this. Because, okay, my original pair here is like, okay, they mutiny, and the players are going to walk the plank, and then they will eventually wash ashore on this island where the majority of the session is going to be. But I also was like, nah, there's just, there's no way players are going to let themselves get mutinied. Like, they're definitely, uh, like, I, I don't know what they're going to do, but I know they're not just going to walk the plank willingly. And I really struggled for a while. I was like, how in God's name, like, do I get them to this island? Um, but the solution was pretty simple. Just William Wid has a treasure map on him. And good thing that I gave him that map because, of course, they did not uh, let themselves get mutinied. Blasting Bobby blew up the entire ship as soon as he heard that this mutiny was occurring. And then Harriet de Barbara just stabbed William Wid while this whole explosion thing was happening. And then found his treasure map, and then uh, they all went down with a giant barrel of gunpowder and floated safely to the island. And the island was uh, de la Isla de Ranascudo. I, I, I don't know if I'm, how horribly butchering Spanish I am, but, uh, Frog, shield, turtle, because I know that's in, in German how, how they make the word turtle. So it is a, it's a giant dragon turtle that can swim around because, of course, if you're doing an island in pirate land in D&D, &D, it's going to be a giant dragon turtle. Uh, in the middle, there is a giant volcano with a ring in it, Mount Sulphur Shell. On the one hand, I was like, ah, am I kind of just running back the plot from the last session with... You're trying to get a treasure. But then I decided, like, ah, oh, screw it. They, had, they were the ones who decided to just run back. You guys are old-timey, black powder era outlaws. It's just the same thing, but, like, on the water instead of out in the American frontier. So, uh, whatever. I'm just going to run back the same thing as last time. Um, <laughs> which, if anything, it was actually pretty funny that the... Players uh, just completely ignored the main plot, just did not bite onto this, this hook at all, which, on the one hand, I didn't really know what to do or where to go with things because of that, 
But on the other hand, like, oh, I, I wouldn't want it any other way. Like, that, that's just pure D&D &D right there. <laughs> um, so I'm ultimately glad that they were able to find their own sort of uh, goals and then make up their own motivations to pursue those goals. I'm, I'm glad that that's uh, how it ended up going down. But originally, okay, so they were going to have this treasure map and they were uh, supposed to want to try to find the treasure, which was going to be in this uh, volcano. And it was going to be a ring of elemental command that was going to let them command a super giant Avatar The Last Airbender sized water elemental. And so my original plan was that the mutiny was going to work. They were going to get washed up ashore. And then they were like, great, now we've got this super mega ring that we can use. And we can get revenge on William Wid and take our ship back. Um, that's not what ended up happening. So yeah, so mutiny, if it succeeds, they have to go to the island and try to recruit everyone and build a giant crew to go back and fight William Wid. But if they prevent the mutiny, then they just can just sail to the island. And then the inhabitants will all just become obstacles that they will need to get past uh, yeah i guess what ended up happening was somewhere in the middle where they just blew up the ship and then they made some enemies and then they made some uh friends while on the island okay so islands and you i saw this in a reddit comment about a pirate session about someone including clownfish merfolk circus which is like oh that's just so good uh scroll this i didn't end up using okay the the governor Flinny Errol is a play on the famous Errol Flynn, which, so I tried, now uh, for the Western game, I watched a bunch of Western movies, but when it comes to pirates, they're just, there's Pirates of the Caribbean, and that's literally it. There are no other good pirate movies, except there's a million of these Errol Flynn pirate movies, none of which I watched because I assume they are old bad movies. And apparently Errol Flynn is like a horrific dude who got like married to like a 15 year old, but like started dating her when she was 12, which uh, there, there was like some horrifically severely messed up things <laughs> that he was doing. Then again, he was like a Hollywood guy in like 1930s. So like that was basically the norm for them. But you know, this guy was going to be like my on the island villain. Um, he's he's married to a 12 year old fear bulg who is going to be like this island's natives um, that, you know, he literally just bought. And I, I guess there was perhaps like a moment of. I, I don't even know if I would call it comedy or not. I don't know what to call it, but uh, fear bulgs are like. 10 feet tall so her being like a 12 year old is like six feet tall or something so probably like the approximate height of the humans and then like i i was gonna try to fabricate some kind of moment where the players realize like wait a second this person that this governor is with is not an adult that didn't really end up coming up at all though okay so the natives they're the fear bulgs chief Moss Walker. Then we also have Faction the Third, the Sunken Court. They got undead pirates that are taking the Fear Bulgs as slaves and then selling them to Dari. They are led by Captain Malakar Doom Wind. Okay, so what I how I decided to uh structure things for this session is every like location, or possibly if you want to consider them factions, you could do that too. I gave each of these a three-part intrusion three-part encounter so they each have like an abc that ostensibly is supposed to connect to the previous intrusion or encounter so in the jungle there's clownfish that they find a, a magical pineapple and then the fear bulgs find them and then there's a fight and then maybe the players team up with one side or the other or who knows? They'll, they'll just do whatever. So this one did occur. The players got washed up ashore. This was the first encounter they found on the island. They decided to sit back and just see what happened. Uh, the fear bulgs like slaughtered these clowns um, and then got back their pineapple. 
Okay. And then, well, I guess part two, I was going to, again, blame ChatGPT. He was writing this garbage. Uh, he said that the, the skeleton pirates show up. Um, and then I, I, he tried, they tried to third party them, but uh, I guess the party was already third party Yang. So whatever we, we, I, I guess I, I could have gone full PUBG, but that didn't end up happening. And then uh, conceivably, you know, if, if, if this pineapple was lost, I, I ended up at, in the session saying, actually, what I, I, I cut the pineapple thing pretty early. I guess I could have actually made it matter, but I guess some combination of I forgot, but ostensibly the pineapple was going to be very important to their sort of ecosystem and like cause everything to fall apart if it was gone. Okay, the volcano. Volcano never ended up even getting touched or looked at. <laughs> but originally there was going to be miners in there mining and then they were attacked by firebugs. And then if you get deep into the cave, there is going to be a salamander that was guarding this treasure this ring and then once they acquired it there was then going to have the whole volcano erupt and then there was going to be this scene where they all had to like run away and do a quick little chase doodad type of deal which i really i should have had the volcano erupt i just totally forgot about that that would have been cool though that i could have just thrown in there Okay, for the port, so there is like a slave auction going underway when they get there. They decide to buy one of the slaves, but they immediately free him and then say like, hey, we're going to work with you. Oh yeah, I should say, yeah. So after the the fear bulgs killed the clowns, uh, they, so, so they like got up and started shooting at the fear bulgs to try to third party them. The fear bulgs ran away. The party ran up and they just looted the clown. So they got like a bunch of money from the circus. Then they went to town. They bought this one slave. His name was Fen Bark. And they told uh, they they freed him and they said, like, look, we're we're gonna help you guys. We're we're gonna like do a whole slave rebellion thing. Then that's what the whole session ended up being, which I'm I'm fine with that. That was cool. Uh okay, so the governor's daughter was going to be kidnapped and by that i mean saved by the fear bulgs and then the party was gonna have the option like ooh, do we want to be evil pirates and like get her back or maybe not understand what was going on and just be like oh no all we know is that the governor's wife has been kidnapped we we don't know the other side of this story so we're gonna go over here and do this thing because we've been told the prize is we are going to get a full ship that we can then make into our own. And that's going to be like the prize for this. Uh, saving her. And then there was going to be a full riot in the streets. Which this then to end up actually happening. Okay. The circle. So there's a whole Black Panther thing. Where like two of the chiefs are fighting each other. And then they they have it revealed to them that the their super artifact the heart of the earth mother was stolen and, and then you know the two sides they decide to like put a hiatus on their duel the, the players did actually they they once they freed fen bark they came back to this circle he came back with them and then they saw all this go down then yep the pirates they stole the this artifact the heart of the earth mother and the the players basically said like all right yeah we know who stole this it was the undead pirates so let's go attack them which they did not know it was the undead pirates but it did happen to be those undead pirates that did steal it okay then they went to the wrecked ship where the undead skeleton pirates were hanging out they uh yep there was this whole thing oh yeah they also so there was some amount of their crew that did survive the ship getting blown up that were in one of the lifeboats. Uh, and then they ended up being able to team up back with them. They convinced them to work with them. So at this point, they had Fenbark plus six of their crew members. They were up to 10 in number. Uh, and then they they just like kill a bunch of skeletons and free a bit few more fear bulgs. Uh, I, th I think that's what happened. But yeah, so so they go to the this ship where like this the captain 
pirate is going to do this full-on sacrifice thing where he's going to uh, do his whole cult ritual and, like, cut open the heart of the Earth Mother and summon a kraken. But the players are able to thwart it. Billy Blades, actually, yep, he uses his magic book and he is able to cast invisibility on Blast and Bobby, who runs in, grabs the heart, and uses his stowaway ability to guarantee be hidden, and they get away with it. Uh, and they they hide the heart of the Earth Mother where only they know where it is. They pretend like they don't have it yet. The fear bulgs like charge down, and then there's like a huge fight, and they end up winning and killing all of these undead pirates. Okay, and then the players went with their army of fear bulgs and attacked the port town. Now this is where I wish I had done things differently. This is where I wished I knew exactly how much time I had to work with. What I should have done at this point was make sure I had at least like an hour for the finale and then made this port battle extraordinarily difficult. Like have reinforcements get, you know, start coming in and then fighting the fear bulgs and killing them and then like it was going to be a you know, players might steal one of these ships and then sail away by the absolute skin of their teeth. That's what I should have ended up happening. But what did actually happen is the Fear Bulgs just slaughtered everyone in the town. And then the players just hopped on a ship and then sailed away. They recruited Fenbark as a member to their crew. I think they press ganged some random people from the town as well. And then, epilogue-wise, Harriet to Barbara definitely won the epilogue competition this time with there being a moment, you know, a callback to Julian being the callback master when the crew was complaining about how the captain always took more than their share than uh, having that come back at the epilogue where Barbara is now on another stranded on a desert island because they have once again <laughs> um, uh, taken more than their share to been mutinied again that was a uh, an, an amazing epilogue from you julian uh okay but here's the original finale so the, the players they were gonna have their whole like evacuation from the volcano thing after getting the ring and then the cult was going to do their cult thing and then summon a kraken. And then the kraken was going to like do a whole tentacle thing, swinging it at the players while they're on the island. And then they were going to realize that, oh my god, this whole thing is a dragon turtle. And then the kraken and the dragon turtle were going to fight each other. And then the whole island was going to sink. And it was going to be up to the players to find some way to get off the island, like with this treasure, and and somehow like survive and you know, like 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 find some way to not sink and die with the island. Maybe use either this heart of the Earth Mother against the Kraken. Maybe use the giant ring of elemental command against the Kraken. Maybe go back and get revenge against Wild, you know, William Wid Warlock. Some combination of those things happening in the finale, uh, none of which I ended up having happen. So I, I printed out a whole long list of names. This I probably should have done for the Wild West game, too. This was relatively useful. I think next time I would curate it, though, to... Like, I, I don't think I'm ever going to need more than, like, five pirate names. So I should have just pulled just the good ones and then just got rid of all, all the other ones. Scurvy Sam. That's a good one. I like that one. Character include intrusions. So potentially Click Clack, the alligator from the peg leg guy, was going to show up and attack or something. Potentially Slitheria Knox and her army of Yuan T privateers was going to come back and for revenge or something. Um, okay, and then the script. Very, very extraordinarily bare bones. We just have my sort of character creation, walk through thing, then intro, ask the characters to give us an intro, 
then part one, merchant ship, part two, mutiny, part three, island, part four, finale. And that wraps up the session. Overall, great time. I'm I'm very, very happy with how it went. Uh, everyone did a great job. It was good session all around. <sighs> okay, so final takeaways. This session versus last session. For this session, I actually I quite liked that ABC structure to encounters that each of the locations had. I think I will keep that and use that moving forward, especially with encounter C having some push towards going towards a new location. For the finale, though, I think I preferred my Wild West style where I just had like a list of like seven potentially crazy things that could occur at the end if they happen to make sense to possibly occur much more so than having like this very strict linear kind of finale that occurs if this specific stuff happened that it makes sense for this to go down this way okay overall great act one great act two act three i could have done a lot better i'm going to make sure to do act three way better in the next session uh, and I'm still going to try to convince people to run their own games. That is it. Goodbye.